Put on some red power armor and prepare to get very angry about the death of your Primarch. Today we're talking Blood Angels in 9th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. In today's video we're returning for a second look at the Sons of Sanguinius and we're going to be doing a bit of a focus on the Blood Angels, going over most of their core rules from the Codex, some of their unique rules that I think are strongest, their unique units, a little bit on the flesh terrors, and one idea for an army list in 9th edition. In general I think Blood Angels are a pretty dynamic and exciting force to play as in game, they pretty much epitomise marine shock assault, and it's certainly good fun to play with an army that hurtles into the enemy lines and causes catastrophic damage. Without further ado then, let's jump straight into it. So at the moment Blood Angels do seem to be doing fairly solidly for Space Marine chapters throughout 9th. Compared with the other Space Marine chapters, I'd say they're perhaps one of the stronger ones, and are certainly at home with the 9th edition missions, favouring aggression and pushing on to objectives. I'd say perhaps their single biggest asset is their really good chapter tactic. Plus one to charge and plus one to wound are both great buffs for a melee chapter. And they do have quite a host of unique units, in particular the Sanguinary Guard are very very strong indeed. As for weaknesses, they don't tend to have all that much synergy with shooting units. Almost every buff is geared towards assault, and generally I think most well-rounded lists will still want a little bit of shooting to balance them out. The other major tone down from 8th edition is that they do have a bit less deep striking flexibility than their previous edition. Before the combination of Wings of Sanguinius and Descent of Angels just meant that you could have ridiculously reliable deep strike charges, and unfortunately that's not really any longer the case. Still though, I think they remain very powerful, and are still putting in decent results at tournaments. So let's start with the Blood Angels chapter tactic and their unique combat doctrine, Savage Echoes. As I mentioned, I think that Red Thirst is perhaps one of their biggest strengths, there aren't all that many things that modify the wound roll in 40k, and those that exist are very powerful indeed. Plus one to wound means that even relatively light strength weapons can still punch far above their weight and really threaten enemy heavy hitters, and I think that for that reason Blood Angels have some of the best synergy with any weapons that are strength 5 or strength 4. Things like the Sanguinary Guard weapons, or anything armed with chain swords, such as Assault Intercessors or Outriders, tend to have a really good time with Blood Angels. On top of that, as well as this excess melee damage output, they're also far more reliable for getting there, they get plus one to advance and charge, which will generally add up to more combats happening over the course of the game, and that's no small thing at all, as the difference between making melee or not making melee can be the difference between your opponent losing entire squads. Plus one to charge is particularly helpful out of deep strike, it means that you only need an 8 inch charge rather than a 9, and that's far more reliable, you're actually around 70% likely to get in, if you can spare a command reroll to reroll the result. On top of that they also have their unique combat doctrine, Savage Echoes, which is an assault doctrine bonus as you'd expect. They get plus one to attack in the first round of melee, which is pretty much good on anything, and of course that'll stack very nicely with shock assault, and that already excellent plus one to wound. It means that say even your average Blood Angels assault intercessor in the assault doctrine will be getting a crazy five attacks at AP minus two, or with plus one to wound, and that's going to do some crazy damage to near enough anything. The Assault Doctrine may be a little bit more relevant now that we can put our squads in Assault Doctrine early for a couple of command points, or use a Sanguinary Priest to obtain the same effect. In general, both of these rules are excellent, and just make Blood Angels a really dangerous melee army. Aside from their core rules, I thought we'd just talk about a few of the very strongest Warlord traits, Relics, Psychic Powers, and Stratagems. I'm not going to go through the entire list of every one, but these are just a few of my favourites. For Warlord traits, you can make a very fighty smash captain with Angel Exemplar, that allows you to stack two Warlord traits on the same model, and you can combine some really useful ones, such as Gift of Foresight and the Imperium Sword. Perhaps my single favourite Warlord trait is the Gift of Foresight, that's the one that allows you to reroll one hit, one wound, and one save during each player turn, and it just makes for an exceptionally fighty smash captain, who's a lot harder to kill in return as well. When you get to reroll one dice on a 4 plus invul save, it really gives you a high chance of negating a nasty shot with a lot of damage. Otherwise, Artisan of War can be fun to stack multiple relics on the same model. Soul Warden can give himself and nearby units a bit of immunity against mortal wounds, and Heroic Bearing is quite a nice little aura buff if you did want to have more of a buffing character. Otherwise, from the main codex, Rites of War for an aura of Obsec on your assault troops is handy, and of course the ever useful Imperium Sword, giving you some reroll charges, plus one strength and attack. I'll admit the Gift of Foresight remains my favourite though. For Relics, a few of my favourites are the Icon of the Angel, 
Quake Bolt and Wrath of Bomb. The Icon is a nice aura of re-rolling charge rolls, could be handy for Deep Strike people in particular. The Quake Bolts will allow you to put one enemy unit at plus one to hit in melee, really quite handy for when you're charging a big unit into them. And Wrath of Baal is an interesting jump back for the Sanguinary Ancient, it gives him an extra aura of plus two movement to nearby models. Very handy for any jump back units starting on the board, and will give them a much better chance of making their charges. If you just want some sheer fighty power, the Hammer of Baal isn't bad either. A Relic Thunder Hammer with no minus one to hit penalty, and also AP minus three rather than minus two. From the main codex though, I absolutely love the Teeth of Terror in Blood Angels. It'll typically give a captain 8 attacks at strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 2, and the strength 5 really works well with the Blood Angels plus 1 to wound, meaning that you're going to be wounding most things very very easily indeed. Can also be an interesting option to make a sanguinary priest more fighty. For psychic powers, there are two pairs that really interest me. If you're going for a fighty librarian type model, something like Mephiston or the Librarian Dreadnought, I'd be very tempted by Wings of Sanguinius plus Quickening. Wings gives you an extra boost of movement, allowing you to make far longer charges than you'd normally be able to, and Quickening makes you hit a lot harder, and it gives you a further boost to charging. Really quite nice if you do just want another HQ that's very threatening. Otherwise, for a more buffing Librarian, I'd be tempted by Shield of Sanguinius and Unleash Rage. Shield of Sanguinius grants a 5 plus invul save to a unit, and Unleash Rage will give you exploding sixes to hit, another very nice combat boost. Something like that certainly wouldn't hurt on a big unit of Death Company, charging into the enemy. Finally, I'll be honest, I find a fair few of the stratagems and Blood Angels a little bit underwhelming. We'll talk about a few of the more specific ones when we go through the units, but perhaps one of the most generically useful ones is one command point for Descent of Angels. That gives your unit plus one to hit on the turn that they come down, and also allows them to ignore any modifiers to charge rolls. The latter could be situationally useful, but really that plus one to hit roll is the biggest thing. It's particularly handy on a big unit of Inceptors, dropped in and then they'll hit with all of their scary firepower on a 2 plus rather than a 3. Otherwise I think that the death company options are quite nice, Forlorn Fury gives them that pre-game move to get them a first turn charge and Refusal to Die can give them a 5 plus feel no pain. Don't get me wrong the Blood Angels have quite a lot of other options, but a lot of them just tend to be quite niche in my opinion. Another couple of interesting options from the codex are the option to use death company characters and to take some of the Blood Angels secondary objectives. Death Company characters, you can upgrade a Captain for 20 points, or a Lieutenant for 10. It means that their re-rolls can only be used for Death Company units. They gain the Black Rage for the 6 plus feel no pain, extra attack on the charge, but also not being able to fall back and not being able to do actions. And they can also make use of the pretty nice Death Visions rule. That means once per game, if you're close to a character, you can get 4 re-rolls to hit, a 3 plus inball save, or basically a 50-50 chance to get D3 plus 3 mortal wounds in lieu of the character's attacks, and if you win the roll off. For me I'd say that the Death Company characters are kind of well balanced, I wouldn't say that they're absolutely auto include, but if you did want to soup up a captain to be as scary as they could possibly be, getting an extra 6 plus feel no pain and an extra attack on the charge isn't really a bad thing. I think that the death visions are just a little bit unreliable, they might come in handy if you can run up against a character, but that's not going to happen every single game. For the Blood Angels unique secondary objectives, honestly I think that the ones from the Blood Angels codex are really quite weak, maybe Blade of Sanguinius could be an interesting one if the opponent's warlord is basically one that needs to be charging forward, that's the one where you get points for killing the enemy warlord in melee, preferably with your warlord. Really though for Blood Angels I think they want to be looking at the Oaths of Moment for unique secondaries, that's the one from Codex Space Marines where you get points for various different things, including killing characters, holding the centre of the table and not falling back all of the things that Blood Angels might well want to be doing anyway. So let's talk through some of the units in the Codex now, starting with what are in my opinion the all-stars of the Codex, the Sanguinary Guard. At 30 points per model, these are some of the best shock assault troops that Space Marines have to offer, and they certainly compete very strongly with other great options such as Vanguard Veterans or Blade Guards. These guys were frankly already very good before the Codex update, and then they got a multitude of other buffs on top of that. They still retain 2 wounds and their 2 plus armor save, they get a whopping 3 attacks plus 1 with shock assault, and they can strike either with those on Carmian swords or axes, I generally prefer the swords myself, at strength 5, AP minus 3, at damage 2. It's a really good generalist melee profile, plus the blood angels plus 1 to wound means that they're going to be doing hefty damage to whatever they target. Even a squad of 5 of these completely unbuffed would be able to kill a repulsor executioner on average in a single round of combat. That's pretty crazy for a mere 150 points. Those stats alone will be easily enough to justify their inclusion, but they have so many other benefits as well. 
If they're near your Warlord, you get plus one to hit at range and in melee, and if your Warlord's a captain as well, you'll get to re-roll those ones, so hitting on a two plus re-rolling. They have a heroic intervention stratagem, which means that if you park them on an objective, your opponent just can't trot up nearby unless they want to be in combat, just one command point and they can jump into combat with them. They're fast moving and can deep strike with the jump packs, have some decentish shooting with those Angelus bolt guns at AP-1, and even if you did engage them in melee, they'll be minus one to hit with those death masks. It really is nearly impossible to go wrong with a few big units of these guys in the Blood Angels list. Really fast, lethal damage, fair enough durability with a 2 plus armor, and a whole host of secondary benefits on top of that. They're a 10 out of 10 melee unit for me, and when I play Blood Angels, I wouldn't be leaving them behind. Of course, the other big melee combat units in Blood Angels are the Death Company, but these guys don't have quite as many benefits when it came to transitioning to the 9th edition codex. You can either get them for 25 points for marines with jump packs, or 24 points for intercessors, either armed with the bolt rifles or the bolt pistol and chainsword. As we mentioned before, their Black Rage will give them an extra attack, a 6 plus feel no pain, but prevent them from falling back or using actions, so you can potentially use Wings of Sanguinius, another stratagem, to jump them out of combat if you desperately need to. I'm afraid that even with that 6 plus feel no pain, they just look a little bit lacklustre when compared with either Sanguinary Guard or Vanguard Veterans. The Sanguinary Guard will typically hit harder against most targets, and the Vanguard Veterans can be a bit more survivable with those Storm Shields. For me, I think that the main reason to run Death Company at the moment are the stratagems. Forlorn Fury is the one that allows you to move up the board turn 1, and that means that if you can put them in the midfield before deployment, then it near guarantees you a first turn charge, as you can move again and assault the enemy battle line. That's not something that Vanguard Veterans or Sanguinary Guard can do, so getting a devastating Alpha Strike off is perhaps one of the best reasons to run Death Company in my eyes. That 5 plus feel no pain stratagem is kind of handy as well, it could help them weather a fair bit of enemy damage, though I do think it's fairly expensive for what you get, you already do have the 6 plus feel no pain anyway, and you'd have to pay 2 command points for it if you're using it on a big unit. For more general purposes, I don't really think that Death Company are all that far behind the other Space Marine options, they still remain a very very good unit, but I can see why they're maybe not taken as competitively in quite so big numbers as they might have been previously. Moving on to the Blood Angels unique vehicles, we have their 3 flavours of Dreadnought and the Bile Predator. Out of all of these, the ones that interest me most are the Librarian Dreadnoughts, 150 points for a Dreadnought that can kind of act as a melee missile, getting an enormous amount of movement with that Wings of Sanguinius spell, and very good damage with its Dreadnought close combat weapons plus quickening. It kind of can be an HQ unit that acts more like a battle line unit, adding another fighty and durable threat to the army, though I will admit in my experience, when you tend to send this guy up in any way solo and unsupported, he will just generally get gunned straight down due to a lack of an invul save. Duty Eternal just doesn't seem to be quite enough to keep him safe. In the Elite slot, we have the Death Company Dreadnought and the Furioso Dreadnought, both of which I find kind of interesting. The Death Company one gets the 6 up feel no pain, extra attacks on the charge, and compared with a lot of other Dreadnoughts, really does punch very hard and takes a lot of damage for his points. He does have weaknesses in having no core keyword, and also being relatively slow, only moving 6 inches base movement, but still could potentially be an interesting counter charge threat to put down in the middle of the board and dare your opponent to come in range. The Furioso doesn't have quite the same raw melee stats or survivability, the main reason I'd want to run a Furioso is because of the Frag Cannon, which is a fairly solid close range general purpose weapon. Basically a different sort of flavour, a little bit less of a melee threat, but able to do a bit of work at range as well. Finally we come to the Bar Predator that's 120 points base, and unfortunately I still think that the Bar is quite underwhelming as a gun platform, as are most Space Marine Predator tanks. I think that the Flamestorm Cannon just isn't quite powerful enough to justify getting that close, and if you want twin assault cannons, you still might be better off with a Razorback. Like most Space Marine tanks, I think that the bar would need to be reduced in points a bit if you wanted to see it fielded more. As well as the Librarian Dreadnought, the Blood Angels do have another couple of generic characters in the Sanguinary Priest and the Sanguinary Ancients. Both of these can certainly have a role, I think of the two maybe the Sanguinary Priest is a bit more competitive, mainly because he's just essentially a flying apothecary with a jump pack. Virtually every Space Marine competitive list seems to run a Chief Apothecary with Selfless Healer these days. He provides a 6 plus feel no pain, healing, and also restores a model from the dead each turn. Generally very good for the points, and the Sanguinary Priest gives you an extra couple of benefits. He can have that jump pack for far better mobility, and get those buffs exactly where you need to, and his Blood Chalice can allow him to put one squad in Assault Doctrine each turn. That means that you can unlock that extra AP-1 and extra attacks on the charge all that more easily. 
and just send one squad of Blood Angels into rage mode each turn. As support characters go, he is really quite fragile, and generally won't provide all that much of a melee threat unless you give him something like the Teeth of Terror for a cheap and fatty assault unit, but for the points for the buffs he gives, they're really quite solid. In the Elite slot, we have the Sanguinary Ancient for 125 points, really quite expensive for an Elite slot character, but again he gives you quite a lot of buffs in addition to what the standard Ancient would. His fast has a 2 plus save, and at least some melee threat with that uncommon sword. He'll do what a normal Ancient will, and allowing you to shoot or fight when you die, and his unique thing is that he can give one of the Blood Angels units a plus 1 to hit when they're in combat. It's all very well and good, though to be honest I think I prefer to have a captain for the same amount of points and pose a bit more of a threat in melee. Though for me perhaps the single biggest reason to take the Sanguinary Ancient instead is to bear that Wrath of Baal relic. That's the one that allows nearby jump pack units to get an extra plus 2 inch movement and let them hurtle across the board and be far more of a fast moving threat. 14 inch movement then charging with a plus 1 to charge is going to get them where they need to be very quickly. Again, he feels like a bit of a luxury pick to me, some very decent buffs, though quite pricey to get them on the table. Then of course we come to the Blood Angels' very impressive cast of named characters. They have no less than seven of them for standard Blood Angels, listed with their points cost here. A lot of these were absolutely outstanding in the 8th edition codex. I do feel in 9th they might have been toned down a bit, and now in general I tend to prefer running the non-named characters over these unique ones. A few certainly do have their uses though. Astarath's an 150 point melee chaplain, he can cast multiple litanies including the Mass of Doom which makes one squad a lot more threatening, fairly solid but quite pricey at 150 points, Brother Cobulo's 115, typically I think I would prefer standard sanguinary priest to him, getting the jump pack and being able to use that selfless healer warlord trait I think outweigh anything that Brother Cobulo brings himself, Tycho's around 100 points depending on whether you field him as a death company character or not, I think generally he'll rarely get taken, as you really want Blood Angels characters to be armed with a scary melee weapon, and the dead man's hand just isn't really all that strong. Mephiston's 155 points, and is quite similar in profile and damage to the Librarian Dreadnought. Fairly solid in close combat, a good option for using wings and quickening to zoom him to the front. I think he's quite balanced versus the Libby Dread, I could happily take either one over the other. Dante is a fairly solid generalist, has fairly decent melee output, and also provides chapter master buffs. I just feel that he's a little bit on the expensive side at 175 points. I guess not a bad upgrade if you were thinking about using a chapter master in the army anyway. The Martyrs is a bit more cheap and cheerful at 120 points. Basically he's the chaplain to pick if you want to buff Death Company with him. So he could be a reasonable choice if you're running at least one big unit of Death Company in the army. Finally the Sanguinor at 150 points is a little bit pricey I think, I was a bit disappointed how much they toned down his buff in the latest codex, it was a bit sad that his plus 1 attack doesn't stack with shock assault anymore. I think the most fun thing about him is his miraculous saviour special rule, the way that he can just step into an ongoing combat and potentially win it for the blood angels. I still feel that he's probably more of a fun choice than a top tier competitive one, but I think that that's quite a cool move that he can pull off. Of course, Blood Angels have far more options than just their unique units, and they can take anything else from the core Codex Space Marines as well. They'll work just great with anything melee. Vanguard veterans with Storm Shields can give you jump infantry a bit more survivable than Sangars. Blade Guard veterans are really tough to shift and hard hitting, though a little bit more slow moving than the jump pack options. I think Assault Intercessors and Outriders are particularly solid with their chainsaw attacks. Strength 4 gets really well improved by getting a plus 1 to wound. Most melee characters do well, particularly captains or chaplains on bike, and he can make an excessively scary company champion by layering on buffs such as chapter champion and the fighty warlord traits. Even incursors and standard intercessors can pack a massive punch on the charge. Even if they're not particularly melee specialists, having a flurry of strength 4 attacks with plus 1 to wound is no bad thing. Even though Blood Angels are a melee army, it often does pay to have a bit of ranged firepower in the mix as well. Some units are just far easier to deal with at range than in close combat. Perhaps one of the biggest shooting synergies are Inceptors with that Descent of Angels rule. Having a decent sized squad of Plasma Inceptors and getting them plus one to wound on the turn that they come in will just make sure that they can put some massive hurt on one key target. Eradicators and Attack Bikes are efficient anti-tank no matter what chapter you take them in. And Redemptor Dreadnoughts are a pretty solid option for the centre of a battle line. Pretty tough, good generalist firepower and of course they can mix it up in melee as well. I thought we'd just have one quick word on the Flesh Terrors, seeing as they are part of the Blood Angels Codex, though I think that they will be quite rare to be run compared with Blood Angels, at least competitively. I feel like their chapter tactic is just a little bit sad compared with Red Thirst, 
You trade out the plus 1 to advance and charge for an extra AP minus 1 whenever you roll a 6 to wound. This does technically mean that they'll hit even harder than Blood Angels on the charge, but to be honest that extra AP boost really doesn't amount to too much. It's a very small percentage increase in the damage and number of wounds you're likely to get through, and I think it just really doesn't stack up well at all against losing the chance to make some easier charges. I guess maybe it might incentivize Flesh Terrors to just use a few more low AP weapons such as Chainswords, so they might have a little bit more synergy with them compared with Blood Angels. I'd say perhaps the single biggest draw to the Flesh Terrors is Gabriel Seth himself. He's an 160 point chapter master, so it provides some good rerolls, but compared with Dante, he's just an absolute melee monster. That enormous chainsword of his has him striking at strength 8 with damage 3 attacks, and then after his fought once, he just gets to fight all over again, so you'll typically get 10 attacks out of him every single fight phase. Whether he's fighting a hard target, elite infantry, or even hordes, he's going to go through everything like butter. Certainly a solid option, and if you're playing Flesh Terrors, he's a really good include. Otherwise, they do have a few unique options all of their own. A couple of Warlord traits can give them exploding sixes in melee, or ignoring Overwatch. They've got a stratagem for a little bit of extra piling and consolidate, which can be handy when tagging other enemy units. And they've got a unique relic of their own in the Crimson Plate, some relic Terminator armor that allows them to move slightly faster. On the other hand though, they do lose all the Blood Angel special characters, can't get quite as easy access to the higher tier of Blood Angels relics, and the main loss that they have is that chapter tactic. I wouldn't necessarily say that Blood Angels are miles less strong than Blood Angels, but out of the two, I'd certainly rather run pure Blood Angels myself. Finally, I thought we'd just finish up with one idea for a Blood Angels army list, just to showcase a few of the things that the Sons of Sanguinius can do, and this one's loosely based but not exactly the same as a few competitive tournament lists from Best Coast Pairings. In the list we have three solid characters, leading a whole bunch of Sanguinary Guard and Death Company into the fray, a few small squads of troops to secure objectives, and a few roving squads of attack bikes to provide some firepower. To lead the host we have a captured on bike with a storm shield, he takes rights of war, gift of foresight, and the teeth of terror. He's just going to be an all-round problem unit for the enemy, and quite cheap as well. 8 attacks at strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 2, all hitting on 2s, re-rolling a hit and a wound, and if the enemy strikes back against him, he can re-roll one save per turn as well. For the points, he's very fighty and very tough, and he can also provide an aura of obsec with the rights of war. Could be a good choice for nipping up and stealing an enemy objective from under their noses. We've then got a chaplain on bike with a benediction of fury. He's a master of sanctity with a wiser rater, so he's able to cast the litanies a bit more reliably. He takes the mantra of strength to make him excessively fighty, and also has the canticle of hate and the litany of hate to allow for some slightly easier charges and for some full rerolls to hit in an aura around him when the Blood Angels do engage the enemy. Finally, we have a sanguinary priest with a jump pack. He takes Chief Apothecary and Selfless Healer, and he'll hopefully be jumping around giving out his 6 plus feel no pain, restoring wounds on injured models, and also bringing back the odd model from the dead. I think maybe in hindsight it might have been good to give maybe the caption on Bag a Thunder Hammer or something, and perhaps move the Teeth of Terror onto this guy, so he can actually be a massive melee threat in himself as well. He'll certainly enjoy putting the Assault Doctrine on one of the units each turn, perhaps the Death Company turn 1, and then the Sanguinary Guard after that. We've then got 3 squads of 5 troops, 2 units of incursors to hold down the midfield, and potentially even go for some cheeky first turn charges. They'll certainly leave a mark with their AP-1 attacks, and lots of them. And then we've got a unit of intercessors just with standard bolt rifles, they're going to be holding down a home objective. Then we come on to the real heavy hitters of the army, a unit of death company, and 3 units of sanguinary guard. The death company are all equipped with jump packs, the most take chainswords, and we have 4 power fists within the unit. These guys are going to be the target of Forlorn Fury, so if we get first turn, they'll be aiming to jump straight into the midfield, then have a first turn charge on the opponent, and if possible they might try and chain back to the Sanguinary Priest to allow them to get into the Assault Doctrine turn 1 2. Hopefully they should just leave an absolute devastating hole in the enemy army and kill something important right off the bat. Following them up, we have two units of 9 Sanguinary Guard, all armed with Oncarmian Swords. They'll be aiming to jump along with the Chaplain and Captain, ideally staying out of line of sight or in light cover if possible, and when they get into melee they should have plus 1 to hit from having the Warlord nearby, and also re-rolling hit rolls of 1 because of the Captain, unless they take some heavy casualties, virtually anything that they should touch should melt immediately. We've then got another small unit of 5 Sanguinary Guard, these guys will typically aim to deep strike, coming down for an 8 inch re-rollable charge with a command re-roll, and hopefully clearing out one threat that the opponent wasn't expecting to get engaged. Even an unsupported unit of 5 of these guys can certainly pose a threat. 
Finally, for a bit of general purpose fire support, we have three units of two attack bikes, all armed with multi-melters, and these will put a fair bit of hurt on enemy heavies as the main advance moves up, maybe trying to focus fire down any really big threats, and chipping away with their bolters at light infantry and hordes, should hopefully provide a bit of movement and slightly more expendable units as well, if we need to capture objectives or put things in table quarters. Overall, I think that the list could be quite good fun to play. An absolute ton of devastating melee, some fire support and some obsec, though I would say that the list is fairly fragile if you take some heavy losses with the sanguinary guard and you could be in for a bad time. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed a bit of a run through Blood Angels in 9th edition 40k. As always, if you have anything else to add or any other insights that you think I've missed, please let me know down in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video and you'd like to see more like it, feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics. I'll certainly be trying to do a few more army overviews like this for other factions as the edition carries on. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the content on the channel and you'd like to help keep it going, I would just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page which you can find down in the video description. Making all of these videos does take a fair amount of time and if you are enjoying regularly then any support is enormously appreciated. I do try and give a fair few rewards to channel patrons including seeing certain new videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry to the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support the channel, the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a really big thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.